Hello, we want to thank you for joining our um, Plus R Service Dog Task Support Group. Tonight, we're going to be talking a little bit about realistic expectations for task training. So while most of our videos kind of cover how to train a specific task, we answer a lot of questions about when to train tasks and, <clears throat> and also common problems that occur when training tasks and things like that. So we kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that so before we actually get into that we want to talk about one thing that you absolutely can train a puppy <laughs> so we all know there's a lot of tasks that you don't want to train a puppy because it's more than what the puppy can handle but everybody gets excited and wants to train their puppy super early so there are a few things you can train a puppy and one of the big ones is the foundational behaviors of targeting so whether you're looking at a nose to hand target a chin rest target a paw target of some sorts you know um like closing doors uses either a nose target or a paw target and or drawers doors the cabinets that kind of thing um closing other doors like a house door might use a tug toy and other things so those certain foundational things you can absolutely teach a puppy so we want to just go over a couple of those things in guidance as far as like teaching puppies those things um and some other fo easy foundations that you can teach puppies or adolescent dogs before they're really ready for task training so a big one that I like to do is the hand targets because hand targets you can use for so much else. And that typically involves the dog's nose touching your hand. And so that's what I mean when I call them hand targets. And you can use that for, I like the task you can use it for is endless. There's so many of them. But I use it at an early age as a game to help guide my puppy to move around me and so like a four to six month old puppy can learn the heel position with a hand target they can learn to stand in front of you they can learn to be facing you they can learn to move behind you or go in between your legs and all these cool positions around you if they know a hand and nose target so that's a really good early foundational task that you can teach a very young dog and then later you can apply those nose nudges or whatever to different alerts and things that you want. So that's kind of something that's really important to consider is what are you training and what age is your dog? So um, I know we also have Cindy and Elliot here that want to kind of talk about the same thing. So who wants to go first about talking about early foundational kind of targeting stuff? Well, I unmuted first. So, <laughs> um, early foundation targets are so important because you use them for everything. Um, you can what, what it, using paw targets. Penny talked about the hand targets and how useful those are. There, I can't say enough for hand targets. That is the first thing I teach my dogs. I also teach paw targets, and the reason I teach paw targets is because I can get my dog positioned better if I have if they know where they're supposed to put their feet for something. So and they know how to use their feet. So I can get them into a tight heel and moving around me because there's times when I'm out in public I want my dog doing that. There's times I want him to just not be so rigid and not be have a forced <gasps> heel like that at me, but there's times I want him to get in close and I want him to know where that position is. And so if I have something that I can use for a target to put him, to have him put his feet on or put his body on while I'm teaching those skills, then it makes it go smoother. And it really helps a puppy to know, to learn how to put their feet on things. The other thing it does is it allows you to go out and when you're out walking your puppy, and you want them to learn, experience the world and see what, you know, different textures are, different elevations are. 
it allows you to teach have your dog put paws up on something like a slide or a wobbly to, um, toy at the park or a rolling bar um, i'm just thinking of some things i've had nick put his paws on it could be a rock it could be a sculpture that like at a park not in the museum <laughs> but you having them be able to put their paws on something that you direct them to it also helps with photo ops it helps them learn to get up on things it helps them with so many skills that you'll need down the road not just for this is how i behave in public but also for okay i've got confidence because i don't need to be afraid of the slide because i can put my feet on the slide and i know it's not going to hurt me even whether it's yellow green or red um so it's really important to be able to do that i also teach rear foot paw targets but i do that more as a fitness exercise and for hind end awareness for some different things because nick is a sports dog he also he doesn't he doesn't have one career he's got multiple things going on in his life and he needs to be fit so having him be able to put his feet his rear feet um, which i call feet uh, where I direct them without putting his front feet on is very important to me. It also helps them learn to use their rear end to go around in a circle to get into heel or to um, turn, go into front positions you might need or go into middle even positions you might will most likely be using during public access training and public access work. Elliot? um a couple others that haven't been mentioned um i use place a lot um and variations of it um i'll be talking more about deep pressure therapy and how place can be very useful in assisting with that task training um another is um hold or take or grab you know a, a dog accepting something holding it with its mouth can be very useful for building so many mobility tasks, but also just also helps you with getting husbandry, basic husbandry, getting the dog used to you kind of having stuff around its mouth, playing with the mouth, things like that. Um, and then another one I was thinking of, oh, brain, come back. Um, na other people's names, um, just kind of getting those recall ping pongs and go to mom, go to dad, you know, just running back and forth, which will then as, you know, a very low stress, fun thing for your dog to learn. And then that can turn into a wide variety of other tasks later on, but as a fun, easy foundation for your dog to learn at a young age in a low we, stress. Can I interrupt you just quickly? <laughs> go right ahead. We actually teach that with a hide and go seek game. And that is like, uh, my puppies start to learn that at probably mm -hmm. two months old, three months old, you know, very easily because yeah. they're a puppy, but to slowly build up. And then later on, when they're more mature, we turn it into a task in public or in stores of some sorts or at the park or whatever. So that is a really good foundation all that hide and seek, go find whoever. Yeah. And you can also kind of use it with items too. So any items that you're later later going to want them, start building the idea of things have names. This is a, you know, this is your ball. This is your bear. This is keys, you know, just kind of building that. And those are easy foundations that you can then tie into tasks later on. So we could talk about foundations all night long, but we wanted to kind of focus on some more specific tasks and why or why you shouldn't teach them at certain ages, why some you might be able to start younger and some you really, really need to wait till the dog's mature. And so Elliot, you want to kick us off with those psych alert tasks you were just telling us about? So as most people know, you do not want to start teaching the actual bulk of psychiatric tasks until your dog has reached emotional maturity and that is baseline of 18 months uh, later with larger breed dogs 
Um, you don't want to expose them to the worst of your emotional and psychiatric stress, or you can burn your dogs out really fast, teach them the world is a scary place because you don't feel stable and secure, so the world no longer feels stable and secure. And while owner training, that can be tricky, um, but we're not going to discuss that here so much as what you can do, because you do want to start laying foundations, and there are a lot of foundations you can lay out. Um, like I said, place, you can get your dog really used to things like, okay, place on this blanket. Some people like to use a place to lay place mat over their legs for DPT just because it's more comfortable for them and for the dog if the dog is really kind of, you know, short-haired and bony or they're bony and that can, you know, kind of transition. Here's where you lay. You know, this is where I want you to lay. And you can do that when you're in a good good frame of mind, you're not stressed, you can start getting your dog used to that close comf, you know, laying down on you, especially if the dog does not naturally want to do that, because there are some dogs that don't like that. Um, you can teach the early alert behaviors like paw target, hand target, um, things like that, chin rest. Um, that can also be really good for grounding. Um, I always like it if Zappo has his chin, chin rested on my foot at restaurants, so I'm connected to him during, you know, even when we're not actively doing something it helps keep me calmer um and you can you know kind of teach that as a passive thing before you get stress you know when you're not in a stressed out state um orbit orbit tasks are really common you can start teaching those positions and kind of have your dog learn how to you know orbit from one side to the other to behind you and reset but not actively chain it all together until later on because if you are stressed out walking along with your dog and you really need that space you don't want to teach orbit till the dog is better able to handle your stress but you can start teaching those positions and those movements um retrieval you can start laying retrieval with you know fun things rather than you know an urgent oh go get my med bag now but you can start teaching retrieval of you know with toys and lower stakes items and then turn that into a task once if it's something that you need as an emergency situation scent games you can teach scent games and teach the um you know the process of scent training before you introduce your scent alerts which cindy's going to talk more of um lights on and lights off um, people have um, their dogs will go in and turn the lights on before they get in there so they're not walking into a dark room that's a task you can very easily train way ahead of time before you know like turning on and off and then expand it of sending the dog in ahead of you um, once you your dog has reached more emotional maturity um, later is when you can really start pairing those behaviors with the stress but these are a lot of, you know, really simple foundation behaviors you can start working on before you pair them with a situation or um, an emotional state. Because um, things like especially self-harm interruption, you do not want to introduce your dog to until they're fully stable. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Do you want to talk a little bit about why we want to be super careful and some of the fallout that can happen when you do the more um, stressful psych alerts when it, they're too young. Yeah, I mean, self-harm behaviors and self-harm interruption is pretty self-explanatory. It's not too bad. Um, some lower key behaviors, like maybe just scratching, like, you know, just kind of the anxious itching. Okay, that's not too extreme. But if you are someone who maybe kind of really tries to gouge at your arms or kind of hit yourself like that can also be dangerous to your dog if they're not doing it right for one and if you ask you know you do not want your dog who's still developing that trust in that relationship to be exposed to that level of fear from you and as they're trying to help you if you accidentally you know kind of without even meaning to if you accidentally you know kind of thwack them that will break trust so badly to a young dog and that's it that will break any 
any desire of a dog to work for you or if your dog is constantly experiencing so much cortisol from you there have been studies shown that a lot of dog breeds especially like labs retrievers all those one-on-one -on -one hunting dogs their cortisol levels rise with ours if we are always exposing them to that high level of cortisol their level of cortisol is going up as well german shepherds all these so many of these common com companion and working dog breeds that we see they will react to our stress with their own stress so now not only is our cortisol level skyrocketing your dog's is too and now your dog is just going to start to burn out because all they're experiencing is so much stress and that's a lot to handle at such a young age for a dog and then they burn out and they haven't done anything essentially other than be there you know but if they can learn how to manage that stress at a younger age then when they're introduced to our own stress they know how to handle it because they've learned how to moderate their own stress they know how to decompress you know they know how to you know tell us hey i need a break but a young dog will not know how to process properly and we can damage them just by being stressed because now they're stressed too and fear stages um, is another big one if we are scared you do not want a dog in a fear stage to react to the same thing we're scared of because if the, the dog is there to keep us calm but it, now the dog is afraid of the same thing we're afraid of so how do we teach our dog not to be scared of her own fears um you know you can create your own phobia and the dog you're trying to teach to keep you safe from your phobia like crowds if you're super scared of crowds and you're wanting your dog to calmly orbit and keep your space but you're anxious well now you have a dog that doesn't want to just do spacing now they're overprotective of you and that's a huge issue especially if the dog is already prone to guarding behaviors like um, any of the guardian breeds that are becoming really popular as service dogs right now um, like cane corsos i've seen a lot of those you do not want one of those dogs the feeling like strangers and crowds are a scary thing or you are going to have a dangerous situation for you and your dog because the dog just wants to protect you um same with if you faint and first responders are coming you want to you know make sure your dog is calm and you know knows that strangers are not a danger otherwise first responders won't be able to help you um so oh yeah great pyrenees are another common breed that are very protective of people they're livestock guardian and they're great for mobility work they're great for deep pressure but if your dog is taught that the world is a scary place they're going to guard you and protect you and that can manifest in a what looks like aggression because they're scared so you don't want to expose the dog in these fear stages or that have these high one-to-one -one correlation of cortisol to your own to these symptoms until they are old enough to handle it otherwise you risk dangers to your dog you risk burnout and you know it's it's hard when you're owner training because it's a hard thing to shield your dog from but there are ways to manage it that's a really good point and that's something that i do see a lot and have a lot of clients you know they get a puppy and most puppies somewhere between four to six months will start picking up on any kind of emotional or even physical stress that a person is going through so then we see some early warning signs that they're capable of doing alerts and now all of a sudden as an owner we think oh, well i'm less stressed when that puppy is with me or my migraines happen less frequently when that puppy's with me so i want to take them with me everywhere but then when we do that we're not protecting that puppy's confidence we're not making every single outing a positive experience and so we really have to be careful with the, the puppies and adolescents to make sure that we can control our own stress when we're taking them out to specific places so if you're going to a doctor's appointment and you're nervous maybe you're seeing a specialist or something you've never met before 
and you're really nervous about it. So I, as a person, don't really have a problem with anxiety and psych related tasks. But sometimes that new place or that new person might raise my stress levels. So you have to be super careful not to take your puppy into those environments before they're ready for that environment. If you haven't built up to that, and we have a whole nother talk about, you know, choosing environments wisely, but that comes into play really a lot here, no matter what your dog is going to do later in life. If you're taking them into those early environments before they're, when they're too young and not prepared for it, you are going to make the world a very unsafe place for them. And that's basically what Elliot was talking about and how we we really need to make sure we're protecting that dog's confidence and optimism until they're at least 18 months old. And if you have any kind of larger breed dog, large breeds or giant breeds, you need to wait until at least 24 months old before you start and involving them in anything that might be stressful, which is incredibly hard to do. And I understand that, but you kind of have to make a commitment to yourself that you want this dog to be successful. So you know that you have to protect them the best you can. And so you choose your environments wisely. And I will link that video after this one so that you can see that one if you want to know more about choosing environments wisely. Cindy, do you want to go a little bit into the set alerts and some early things versus what you should hold off for till later? Yeah, um, absolutely. So there's a lot of different things that we, a lot of different conditions, issues, episodes that we can teach scent alerts for. What we, and you don't necessarily, you don't want to start with the full, teaching the full blown response scent response um right as a puppy you want to spend some time building some drive to dealing with scent issues so that they know that this is fun and so you take the stress out of mom's blood mom or dad's blood sugar is low what do i do and you know i need to alert i need to alert well you want them to be happy to alert you but when you don't want them to be stressed out to alert you, you want them to have grit and drive to alert you. And it's really important that you spend time building that grit and that drive for those alerts. However, there's other things you can do to help develop their nose skills so that when it comes to teaching the alerts, they start picking up the scent part of it first. So you, obviously you can teach the response you can teach a cued response that has no, but not pair it to the the scent so that when you're ready to start scent training when they're a little older all you have to do is pair that alert once they know the scent you can pair the alert to the scent um you can also teach them to do some really helpful things like finding your keys finding your phone finding the remote Finding the remote is actually a really good one for puppies because I can't tell you how many places I've seen in pet groups where the puppy has eaten the remote and everybody's frustrated or the puppy has eaten the glasses. So those are, you know, go get a bunch of, if you have glasses and the dog's going to retrieve your glasses, go buy a bunch of Dollar Tree glasses and teach them to retrieve the glasses. And that way, if the glasses get broken, it's not the end of the world, but you are, um, there to you know you're able to teach them this is the shape of the object I want you to get it smells like me the same thing with the phone uh, when I start my puppies on retrieving the phone or even Poe was older when she started learning it I took the phone out of the case I keep a my phone in a case I took the phone out of the case and I had her retrieving the case before I had her retrieving the phone because I wanted to make sure she wasn't going to damage the phone before she retrieved it. But th that is, a, believe it or not, that is a scent item. If you start pairing it and if you start hiding it at some point, um, they're going to have to sniff the phone out if you hide it well enough. And you, it's a gradual process to get there. It's not a, you do it, you teach them to retrieve the phone and the next day they're going to, um, 
go pick up the phone automatically and find it. But if you pair it with a super high value reward, they're going to get it really, really quick. And that's a real, it makes it really fun because then you start having um, stuff you can do when it's too hot or too cold to go outside. Um, it's also a really good activity if you have a dog that has any kind of issues with disengagement or with switching, you know, um, arousal up, arousal down, toy switching, um, thinking in arousal, because they really like, once they get it, they really like scent training. And it's something, you know, if, if nothing else, it's worth doing for their entertainment because it is for the dog. That's how, that's their primary sense that they interpret the world through. If they smell far better than we do. They hear better than we do. And um, if they can, if they start learning to find objects by scent, when you start getting ready to pair your scent of what you're, uh, that you need for your medical alert with your behavior, it's going to go much quicker because they already know, okay, I know how to find a scent. I know what a scent is. And now this is a new scent and this is the behavior I exhibit with the new scent. Like some explosive dogs, their behavior is to back up and sit down when they see that when they scent an explosive, explosive device. Um, you know, whereas a diabetic alert dog is going to either nudge or paw or do something um, to indicate that there's an episode going on and they're going to be persistent and you want them to escalate it. You don't want them to necessarily, okay, I mentioned you once, you want them to have that kind of action prompting behavior when you start ignoring an alert uh, because we all do it. Um, but it's super important to build that foundation and that drive because you want it fun. So, you know, you want to pair, you want to get a really hot, you want to get them so they're really drivey on a toy or they're really drivey on a food or one of each. And you want to use those high value rewards when you're teaching your sense and when you're teaching them to retrieve objects that you're going to have them find by scent. Like I have, so my keys are on a, um, they actually have two strips of leather on them. They have a, get. They have one that will go onto my um, hands-free leash belt and they have another like a snap um, tab. So if I'm practicing off leash, I can just grab it off my keys. And uh, sorry, I'm having an action prompting dog here that wants kibble. Uh, <laughs> and um, so if my keys have a scent that's different than my phone, that's still a little bit different than the remote because they're different types of plastic. So you, if you start teaching them to smell these different, you know, to search and find these different articles using their nose, that's not an issue because they're not pairing it with an alert. They're not pairing it with the crisis. They're pairing it with fun. And you're using a high drive toy that you've spent some time investing in. Now, the other thing to consider, though, is when you're, they're in adolescence, their brains go out the window and things they may know very so strongly at four to six months, it's gone, <laughs> completely gone, especially the higher skills level things that they learned. You can almost forget about it. You have to just continually go, go, go on teaching those. You don't want to drill them too hard. You want to make them fun, but you are going to have to continually repeat and reinforce and make it fun, or it just is going to go, I don't know how to do that. But if you, but then at some point, everything will click back and they'll go, oh, I remember how to do that. Um, I had Nick do a task today that he hasn't done since October of last year. He did it today and he did it perfectly. I didn't have him do it for very long because it hurts me, but I want him to make sure, I want to make sure he knows how to do it. So there's stuff, you know, just because it goes out the window when they're an adolescent doesn't mean that they didn't learn it. It just means they can't think correctly during that period. There's a lot of flux, flux in hormones and they don't know how to deal with that. And once they start figuring out how to deal with it, things start coming back. So don't panic, but don't start the medical, 
alerts, the actual alerts, because again, the same as with the psychiatric alerts, which are still medical alerts, in my opinion, because it's all a medical issue. Um, it's just, you know, some are some are visual cues, some are scent cues. And what you want to do is wait until they're old enough to deal with that crisis because you don't want your blood sugar dropping and you be becoming, I'm just using this from personal experience. You don't want to have your blood sugar drop and become the world's biggest crab and, you know, yelling at the dog, yelling at the family members because your blood sugar is 60 and then expect the dog, you know, and then get mad at the dog because it hasn't alerted to your blood sugar being low and the dog's freaking out because you're angry. They don't know what's going on. You don't want that. If your blood sugar is dropping and, you know, you don't want that alert pair. You just want the dog to go in the other room so you can eat something. Um, and because you don't want them th pairing the scent of a low blood sugar with oh my gosh, I'm just going to get in so much trouble. You know, you want somebody else to take the dog out of the room if possible, or, you know, just walk away from the dog and go where there's food. Or if you carry glucagon or something like that, take that. But any of the medical alerts like that can really scare the dog because they know something is wrong. That goes for people who have issues with fainting because of, um, low blood pressure, elevated heart rate, things of that nature. Dogs can sense this. They can sense both types, both the non-epileptic seizures and the epileptic seizures because there's body chemistry changing changes. Unfortunately, there's not research done on it because people don't think it's important enough to have that information. But, and a lot of people think it's require the dog has to come by it naturally. No, the dog just has to know this is the scent that's going to happen and this is what I need to do in response to that. Or this is, and the response to the scent is the alert or the response to, I see, I see what's going on. I see the shaking. I see the stare off into space. This is what my response is, but you don't want to you don't want to pair that behavior before there's an actual, while there's an actual, while they're in adolescence. Penny? I just want to say, um, <laughs> so there's kind of a difference of actually pairing the alert behavior with the action because almost every dog I know that has had that pair at an early age has some kind of fallout from it later. Mm -hmm. Whether it's they're now stressed in the environment, whether they're now overly protective of handler, whatever. Every dog I know is early. But there are some things along with set alerts and like Cindy mentioned, teaching simple find it stuff and whatnot. But there's some other things that you can do with set alerts at an early age as well. Such as if, you're th if your issue is seizures and you don't really want to pair the scent alert with the seizure at a young age because the dog's not emotionally mature enough to do that. But you can teach your dog to do a foundational skill. Like if you're having that seizure at home, you can have the skill of when they see that action, they go lay on their bed. Or if you're out in public, when they see that action, they back off a little bit and hold it down, stay until you're done. And then maybe they come and help you afterwards, which is something you want them to do later on as well, if they're not alerting to the seizure and only responding to it. But you can kind of teach that. So I work a little bit on, and I don't faint very often, but I get dizzy a lot. I want my dogs to know that if I am down, that I don't want them to go wander on their own. So I teach them at a younger age that if I hit the ground, and I do it all through fun, and games, and I've even done it like if Azul has accidentally pulled me over because he's been on his long line or something and gotten too excited, you know, so if I go down, I want them to immediately return to me and hold a down stay at my side or as close as they can get. I might have multiple dogs, so they all might not be able to get right at my side, but, you know, come close and hold that down and they don't get up until I get up. So you can do things like that in a non-stressful way, in a fun way that kind of teaches them. And in a way, you're also improving your recall 
because if you have that emergency where you need them to come back to you, they know, oh, lay down on the ground, mom needs me kind of thing. And that will improve your recall. Not that you want to use it as an emergency recall all the time, but when it comes down to that life situation, if you've trained it, there's a lot of times where Azul is just simply pulling too hard. And I'm tired of reminding him that he's pulling too hard and I'm tr uh, tired of redirecting him. And so my action to that is just sit on the ground. If you're going to pull, we're not going to move. And if I have to stop three or four times, then I'm just going to sit here and we're not going to move for a really long time. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I've kind of trained that as, you know, that's an early thing. Like I may not train that to a four or five month old puppy. But I might start to train that around a year old or something like that when they're a little bit more stable and can, you know, when they're starting to have those issues with stronger pulling and stronger recall and just kind of it's another way to reinforce the come stay by me. I'm not going to use it in a real life situation yet because I don't want to have to hold them accountable for that kind of thing. I want to use it in fun and games and in environments where I know they can be successful. So that was just kind of important along with the scent training is there's those certain foundational skills again that you can do very early on before your dog is mature because you can do it in a non-stressful way. Yeah, I want to add on to that, Penny. You know, a lot just by playing the games, just by just by working with your dog and using positive reinforcement, we do become the most important thing in the environment for them. And, you know, service dog handlers notoriously have problems with separation anxiety with their dogs. And that's actually can come in handy. You don't want that issue. You want to have a way to manage it. But you also can use that. I don't want to be away from my handler to your advantage because like with Nick, he is so glued to me. You know, we all know that they have to go to the bathroom with us. but. The other thing is, you know, if you, do, when I have fallen in public, which has happened, I, one time I broke my wrist, and fortunately I was with my boyfriend at the time, um, and he just, Nick didn't do anything, he didn't do anything wrong, he just stayed there with us, I had, was, had been holding the leash, and Ken just stepped on the leash, and stopped you know he wasn't going anywhere and then Ken helped me up while he was standing on the leash and Nick was just standing there like oh no mom's hurt and this was when he was going through a real big problem with adolescence and barking and lunging and you know where he was really stretching his boundaries as much as he could so it's really you know the more we reinforce them staying with us you know that's good in most situations but they also need to learn how to go away or be away from us yeah you don't need food right now um sorry i have a dog action prompting for food um but scent alerts you know scent training is really a fun thing to start doing i'm really getting into this with nick um because he it also teaches other things it helps them with disengagement it helps them you know, learn how to think in arousal. I think I covered all this. But yep. it, it I think really... you covered a lot. So I think we're good to move on if you're ready. Yeah, let's move on. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about sound and noise alerts because I know that's a common one. And so one of the things that I don't think people realize unless you work with a lot of dogs like a trainer would. So we all most of us know that dogs go through fear stages and the different stages in life as they're going through adolescence. And we may not know all of them, but we know that they happen. So there's a really big one somewhere between eight to 10 months old, depending on like small breeds, large breeds kind of thing. But it usually hits around eight to 10 months. And every single dog I know during that fear stage that hits, it doesn't last the whole two months. It lasts, you know, maybe two weeks, maybe 10 days, something like that in, of that time period. But so every dog I know that has hit that fear stage, they start to notice sounds more in the environment. 
So the puppy fear stage that hits somewhere between four to six months, the dog tends to start now noticing th things that they see that are further away. And then that next one up that comes with around eight to 10 months, they start to notice things that they hear that are further away or maybe more unusual, those sounds they've never heard before. So if we're working on teaching sound alerts, and we happen to be teaching a specific sound alert during that fear stage, we can actually create anxiety around sounds. So I tell all my clients, don't teach sound alerts in general until at least after that fear stage. So even if there isn't, you know, an emotional stress involved with that sound alert, like if you're training the dog to alert you when a smoke alarm goes off or the oven timer goes off or a phone rings, something to that alert, those are not really stressful. So maybe you can teach a younger dog those things, but you don't want to do it before that fear stage where they're paying more attention to sounds. Otherwise, they develop issues from paying too much attention to sounds. So it's been proven that dogs can hear sounds up to seven miles away. Think about that for a minute. So I do know that we have, and it's right around eight miles away, we have a train tracks so that we have to cross before, like on my path to get home. And I've had German shepherds actually start to go nuts and ask to go outside so that they could be outside when I get home. And they do it repeatedly when I'm crossing the train tracks. And we know this because most of my family has GPS on my phone and so they can watch my drive home and they would watch the dog's reaction and every single time it was as I was crossing the train tracks. So if they can hear sounds that are that far away and they may not be able to as a puppy, but I think those things start to develop after this, you know, fear stage that hits at eight to 10 months old. If we're teaching them to listen to sounds in the kitchen and that sounds are important, well, if we do that before the fear stage, then they're going to be noticing all these other sounds further away and think it's a call to action and they have to pay more attention. And then they're going to be overwhelmed with sounds. And so if they're overwhelmed with sounds, that's when the sound phobias hit or the anxiety related to certain sounds, and they may not know what sounds causing a trigger. So a big one for me is we have train tracks near us. And so I had a dog that had some sound phobia issues already, and she hit that fear stage in the winter when all the windows were closed and whatnot, and we couldn't hear the train. So even though she had been exposed to train noises as a puppy, she wasn't really paying attention to sounds very much at that age. So that spring when she was a little bit older and now that her mind was more geared to listening to sounds, all of a sudden that train was more scary when all the windows were open and she could hear it in the house. So she would do a bark like somebody was knocking at the door every time she heard the train. And it took us a while to figure out what the noise actually was because we couldn't see it. We could barely hear it because their hearing is so much better. And that becomes one of the biggest issues with sound phobias is that we may not know what sound they're hearing. We can't desensitize to it. You know, if it's a big one like gunshots or fireworks, then we know what it is. It's easy to determine because we heard it too. But if it's something that's four or five miles away that we can't hear, then we can't desensitize to it if we can't figure out what it is. So it's really, really important. Now there are a cool sound related, to some cool sound related tasks that I will say you can teach a puppy, such as if you want uh, the dog to be able to alert to you when a family member calls your name. So when a family member says, hey mom, and you want the dog to come and let you know that that family member needs help or take you to that family member, you can do that in a low stress kind of fun game building way that's not making it so that the dog is pay, paying attention to all sounds in the environment. They're probably already pay attention to the children in the home or the husband in the home. So if you can turn that into a fun game, kind of like Cindy was saying with the scent training, if you can make it fun, 
you can do the foundational of that beforehand. So I will advise my hearing impaired clients that if you really want to start with a sound of training, start with that one first because you can keep it fun and make it kind of like a ping pong, like your recall ping pong or hand target ping pong thing by sound in a fun, engaging way that you can develop or refine more when they're more mature. So that's kind of the thing with sound, sound and noise training. You just got to really be careful to, you know, prevent the sound phobia issues from happening, from doing those task training too early. So I will kid you not, I've had clients tell me that a breeder told them their dog would be a full service dog at 16 weeks old because it would do sound alerts at 16 weeks old. That's four months old. And so a four month old puppy is not emotionally mature enough to handle being responsible for alerts of any kind. <laughs> they might start doing some natural alerting in that period, but to make them responsible for it and hold them accountable, they are much too young. So I think we kind of really need to make sure that if sound is our major issue, that we are really protecting all sounds and only asking our puppy to in, um, engage with those very happy sounds, those very important ones that are close to home that they're going to hear inside the house and not work on those sounds like that name, hey mom, kind of calling from a child. We don't want to train that in a public place if that environment might already be slightly stressful because then that's going to add stress to the task. So we want to make sure that we only train those early ones. Even if it's the sound for Hey Mom, we want to only do it in a fun way in controlled environments like our home where our dog feels extra safe. So that's my thing on sound phobias. So we also wanted to cover some mobility tasks because this is a huge one. And since Ellie's been quiet the longest, I'm going to let her start and kind of talk to us about how mobility tasks can harm a dog if we start them too early and maybe some of those ideas of tasks that would do that. So most people have are aware, but I'll go over it anyways. We do not want to start mobility tasks until the dog's growth plates are done and the dog is has reached kind of their full physical maturity, which is about two years of age. Some dogs, it can be closer to two and a half to three, but you especially do not want to start before age two for any sort of mobility work. The reason being is any sort of strain we put on our dog can injure their body and create a whole host of issues, even if it's not on their joints, but just on their muscles or any of that. So we don't want to start mobility tasks until our dogs are physically mature enough to do those tasks without injury. And even then, you still have to condition the dog to be up to par with certain mobility tasks, but that's a whole other topic. So in the meantime, though, you can start to kind of lay some of those foundations for tasks such as um, some people have um, mobility dogs kind of help guide them to another person if they're in a need. So you can do that recall ping pong where the dog learns the name of another person so they know, hey, you know, take me to, you know, take me to mom, take me to dad, take me to you know, whoever, the dog can kind of learn kind of that foundation of, oh, run over to so-and-so and then eventually gets tied into, you know, um, you know, guiding you with um, the handle. Same with hide and seek. <laughs> Take me to my leader. <laughs> um, but, you know, you can, you can start to have those fun games that will then later on turn into guide and mobility tasks. Um, 
Uh, some people will buy the harnesses early on with the handles just for their dogs to begin to experience having that handle on them. Never use it, but you can, you know, desensitize your dog ahead of time to the handle. It can be really, if you have one of the long, like, rigid, mo rigid guide handles, that can be really weird for a dog. So desensitizing them to that gear ahead of time before they need to really be used to it, that's while not a task, something you can do ahead of time to help a dog get used to having that on regularly. Yes, yeah, soft handles are safer, but um, soft handles are definitely safer, but we all know the rigid handles are still sadly well advertised by a lot of gear companies and a lot of um, pop service dog official, you know, service dog training organizations. They're still very commonly used. Soft handles are definitely much kinder on your dog and also generally, I, from what I've seen on joints, because they can absorb some of the shock better. Um, that a rigid handle does not distribute, will just redistribute out into your joints. Um, this is what I get for being up at 10 p.m. my time. Um, my brain is going. So I'm going to ping pong over to Cin Cindy while my brain recovers. Okay, so, so there's, when you're talking mobility, part of mobility tasks, because we're talking about, oh, get out of here. Sorry. Okay. My retired dog is demanding attention. Um, part of mobility tasks, yes, we are, we're all familiar with things like you know, the dog's doing guide work or um, momentum pulling or counterbalance. But what gets overlooked, I think, is people forget that turning on and off lights and retrieving and opening and closing doors is actually a huge part of mobility for a lot of people. And even though I have full use of my arms and legs, I use those tasks a lot because I don't have the mental energy to deal with some things. And I found that having my dog do things that I may be capable of, but he's also capable of doing since he's younger and he's got a fit mind, it's much easier for me to give him a cue to do something and save my brain power for other things than to think, okay, this is how you close the door. This is how I take my top off when I'm getting ready to change to go to bed. And we need to remember that we can start the foundations of these when they're young. And that's good because it gives somebody, and then you can start using those tasks. Elliot, you had a question or a comment? Oh yeah, I was gonna say my brain kicked in. I was gonna say one thing to work on is training out of a, being able to train both a tight heel and a more relaxed, loose lead. Because if you are going to eventually ask for anything like forward momentum, you don't want your dog always in that tight heel and unable to pull you forward. So if you can early on train that difference between I want you in heel and I want you slightly ahead of me so that they can do that forward momentum later on, that will be infinitely helpful in not having to untrain that tight heel later on. That's actually a really big one that I see a lot. Because a lot of people with service dogs, when they're a first-time trainer or whatever, they tend to think that, oh, they need a rock-solid heel. I need them in a heel. Everywhere we go, I need to be in a heel. So if you spend 12 to 18 months only reinforcing the heel, and then when they hit that maturity and you start doing task training and you've never allowed them to you know, freely sniff the ground or walk out in front of you. I'm a big one for that. Um, my dogs every, you know, when we do an exercise walk, that's for them. They are always, they're not always out in front of me, but they have the choice as to if they want to be out in front of me, they want to be out to the side further away they can be behind me they can move kind of freely with what they're wanting to stop and smell with the restriction of they can't pull on the leash but uh, you know so 
And then also if we are in an environment where a person or a bike or another dog might be coming back, I ask my dogs then to pop back in a heel for a short time period. But so they're very conditioned to taking that longer walk in different positions and whatever positions make them happy. So if you focus on that tight heel their whole life and they've only been re reinforced for that and they've never been reinforced for anything else, you can still teach them to step forward in that forward mobility pull, but your time for training is going to be much longer. So with the early stuff I did with Azul in the forward momentum pull, such as making the leash just taunt when we were going up a hill so not really pulling but a taunt or leash up a hill I was later able to turn that into the actual forward mobility task in a heel going up hills when he was old enough but that was because he had practiced okay when we have a difficult situation like climbing a hill we're going to have the leash taunt but if you've never had that happen you know so he learned forward mobility in just a week or two because he had that early practice and that early reinforcement whereas if you've never done any of that and only reinforced the heel and have heavily reinforced the heel for 18 to 24 months then now all of a sudden you want them to stand a foot ahead of you so that you can hold on to that handle then they're really going to take a lot longer to learn that task it's not going to be a couple of training sessions it's not going to be a week or two weeks it's going to be a couple of months of working on that particular task before they actually start to get it because you completely change their rules and i thought go ahead elliot as i say and it also goes into for if people are using any any sort of pulling assistance with their wheelchairs um again you want your dog to be able to understand sometimes they're allowed to be out of a tight heel they're allowed to move forward and i've even seen someone who can't um drive but who doesn't use a wheelchair they've used um basically a yoring system with a scooter for faster momentum um so that they can get around a little bit that way with a little bit of assistance with their fatigue but not drive so they can do all that i actually do that with azul it was one of the um first pulling like i don't use a wheelchair so at least i don't now and it may one day in the future but i have a scooter with 12 inch wheels so if i'm having one of those days where the fatigue is so bad as long as it's not paired with the dizziness because i won't step on the scooter with the dizziness <laughs> but we can find a nice flat trail and he still can stop and sniff when he wants to sniff but being able to stand there versus walk the trail it means he can go a little bit faster than he normally would because I can't keep up with him and I'm not thoroughly exhausting myself by doing it. So that's a very good point. And we started training that maybe a little bit younger, around 18 months, because he's a husky and kind of designed for pulling. And that was such a light pull. <laughs> but we also then had to deal with the adolescent spaz of we had to make sure we chose locations correctly because I got very injured when I gave him permission to chase a squirrel and we went too fast and things like that so you do have to really be careful of those things if the dog's impulse control is not good enough even though they may be capable and strong enough to actually give the pull you want if you're teaching them that it's okay to pull sometimes and their impulse control tells them that they want to go say hi to that other dog walking toward them on the trail they may want to do that more than the stop cue you've been working to train them so you have to kind of be really really careful with that and that's just one more reason why you want to wait to do those pulling or speed related training things until the dog is developmentally mature and emotionally mature and have that impulse control back we all know that adolescents pretty much lose their impulse control ability and it comes and goes and comes and goes but since it's so unpredictable we don't want to train things like it's okay to chase something at this particular time when you know when it's not something in an environment we can control 
I did teach Azul to chase my flirt pole because that's more of a prey drive and I'm doing that in controlled environments and it's only when that, those particular toys come out kind of thing versus if I'm teaching them to pull the scooter and I can't control the squirrels. I can control the flirt pole, but I can't control the squirrels. I can't control the other dogs we might see on a trail and things like that. So you really have to consider that when you're looking at those mobility tasks that involve pulling. Um, Elliot, did you also want to talk a little bit about counterbalance since your thing is harnesses? Um, I was going to say, I've seen, sorry, my brain is so tired at this point, at this time of night, it's almost 11 where I am. Um, you just came back from vacation too. So I yeah. will tell you that my form of counterbalance, so I don't really need huge counterbalance. What I need is a very light kind of just stand still because my counterbalance is for dizziness. So it's not actually weight bearing. And so I use the soft handle where I, there's no possible way I can pull down on the dog. It's all pulling up or maybe slightly to the side, but it's not enough to the side where it's actually going to throw my dog off kilter or, you know, make him stumble sideways. So I do start training my counterbalance since it's so light at around 18 months when I start doing the forward momentum pull. But if your counterbalance is more strong or, you know, you're like if you're trying to do it because you, your whole left side of your body gives out and you need to act, you need them to actually bear some of your weight for a moment, then you really, really need to make sure you're waiting until those growth plates are in place. Yeah, I was working with someone who needed it for vertigo, like full on vertigo and needed a lot more of that weight bearing bracing. Um this standard poodle in question would have to really square up whenever the handle was grabbed because that was well there was a lot of weight being put on it's really important also when you're choosing your dog going back that far your breed of dog not even the specific puppy to consider how much weight bearing do you really need on your dog or do you need weight bearing like i I use, I get, like Penny, I have issues with dizziness because I have a visual problem that causes my eyes to switch back and forth where I'll use one eye and then the other eye and it can do it in rapid succession or it can do it very slowly. And if it's doing it in rapid succession, usually when I'm tired and out of spoons, I, I can stand and I can be stable, but I need something to keep me for lack of a better word, grounded and in touch so I know where I am in space. And I can use a very light grip on my dog where I'm not actually even putting pressure on my dog because I'm just holding the handle and I know the handle's attached to the dog and I know when I'm holding the handle, the dog's in a certain position and I can see where the dog is. And that gives me the enough of a visual cue to kind of manage the dizziness so that I can walk. And if it got worse, I, I, I can, you know, I, the dog's there. If I can feel I'm pulling on the dog, I can sit down. I can do what I need to do so I don't fall down. That's right. it's important to really keep that in mind when you're choosing harnesses and when you're choosing your dog, your breed of dog, that you get the right dog for the right job. I initially chose a great Pyrenees because I thought, well, I really need that extra mobility. I need to be able to put a little bit of weight on her. And what I found with working with her over the course of several years, that that really wasn't what I needed. Um, I found that by teaching her other tasks, what I really needed was the other tasks because the other tasks would prevent a lot of the other symptoms that I was having with dizziness because I was able to manage my fatigue better. And so sometimes it's an experiment to figure out where you need your mobility and how much you need with your mobility. And don't be afraid to question that and to make changes 
in your training based on what you need. Like I find it more valuable to have my dog pick things up off the floor and hand them to me or to go get something for me because it's then I either don't have to get up or he can find something I've lost or I can, you know, he can help me do something that's not going to cause me to make spin my head around a lot, which also comes into my mobility issue because I have a neck issue as that's related to my head injury. And so it's important when you're thinking about tasks that you're going to work with, what's going to work, but what has worked in the past and what hasn't worked. And then base your task training around that. And before you even start the mobility, the, the heavy duty mobility tasks, start some of the other stuff so that you can find out if that's going to really, if that's going to make a difference too, because it may. Elliot? Now that my brain is working again, um, the posturing that we worked on with him was so that working on a really squared stance and body awareness so that he would naturally already be bracing when the handle was grabbed. So that because if your dog is in a messy stance and you grab it, well, your dog is not going to be prepared to bear that weight. So we worked on the dog just being in a good stance that's something you can you want your dog to be able to do if you want that counterbalance if you need that stability you want your dog to immediately square up essentially and brace in preparation for you to grab that handle and that was one of the things we did work on a lot was you know before any weight was it just put on was just you know getting that posture right and then tying it to hand is reaching for the handle square up that way you know the dog could bear that weight safely rather than it being taken by surprise because that can also be damaging i think we kind of need to wrap up because elliot needs to go to bed and this is becoming a very long video but i just <laughs> kind of want to mention one thing though penny what go if, ahead. if you're doing mo mobility where you need a where you need a harness and you're going to be holding on to the harness Another area that you can start training even before you put a harness on your dog of any kind, unless, you know, you're using the harness for, to attach your leash to, um, but before you ever touch your dog while you're doing training, you can teach your dog to stop at all curbs or steps and to go up the step one step at a time so that you can reach down and grab that mobile so that they know, okay, I stop here, I wait for my person to move forward. I stop here. I wait for my person to move here. And that is that can be a huge foundation for your dog so that you don't trip on something. Like I have a curb out in front of my ha house that's painted blue and it's but it's a it's about a 1 inch to 2 1 to 2 inch lip in a handicapped parking spot that is supposed to be a ramp and I you know, it's not going to get fixed, even though it's technically out of compliance with the current ADA standings, and it's not going to get fixed until the company gets sued. So in, in a situation where you see that blue curb and you're expecting it to be a smooth surface for somebody to roll their walker or their wheelchair up, it can be that dog stopping at that curb can be enough of a cue to keep you from tripping. So that's a really good thing to start teaching as a puppy. And it can be taught, you know, as you're teaching them to walk nicely on a leash. And so the other good thing I want to go back to for just a minute with the tight heel, it's important to teach your dog to get in and walk close next to you. But one of the things you shouldn't do Unless you're doing, you know, unless you need a competition heel for any reason, you don't need to teach your dog to stare up, to turn their head and look up at you while they're in a tight heel, because that's going to just tweak their neck. If every time you go to this, every time you go out, your dog's in a tight competition heel. I mean, even when I'm working on heel specifically, I don't ask for that head up. That's totally his choice. If I have my hand in the position that we use for competition yeah I like it and he gets rewarded for it but I'm not going to force it because even if he doesn't look up at me 
when we're in the show ring, it's not going to disqualify him and he's not going to lose points for it. I'd rather have my dog looking around, not necessarily reacting, but being aware of the environment. So like if I tell him to take a jump, he doesn't like walk into something in the process. So it's really important to think not just about, you know, what works, what looks good and what works for me, but also what is good for my dog and what's going to keep my dog working for the longest period of time. Very, very good point. So I do just want to say that a lot of people don't think when there's mobility tasks because when we've talked about some of them already, but so there are a lot of mobility things that are more or less light mobility that can be taught earlier, such as the retrieving items off the floor or turning the lights on or off, even closing doors and drawers, or um, like we talked about, go finding a person. You know, so those are things that you can teach at a very young age. I mean, as Zul started playing hide and go seek in the house with family members and learning those names at like three months old. And so maybe by eight or nine months old for a fun game, we would also say, go find daddy when we were at the store, when I knew he was close by and, you know, only maybe one aisle away or something and it was easy and Azul already knew dad's scent so he could then apply the scent with the name and so later on we developed it now we can do it anywhere in pretty much any store or any environment with those names that he knows but in the beginning it was more of just the game and a loose leash now he does it with a forward momentum pull to get me to that person so it's more of a task but it started with a game and so really look at the games for those light mobility things, you know, such as retrieve or turning the lights on and off and even closing the bedroom door or closing a kitchen cupboard, um, pushing the handicap button. They're all very low stress things that we can teach a young dog while we're waiting for them to mature. So let's kind of end on that note. Unless anybody's dying to say one more thing. You're muted, Cindy. Teaching the dogs to do those things. You know, there's a lot that your service dog has to learn. I spent close to two and a half years because we had some issues with dog attacks. Retraining all of my obedience and rally and general good behavior and getting my dog past being an adolescent brain because pools don't really settle down until they're three and um that he he does have tasks and it's great that he has tasks and i love that he has tasks and but it's also important to remember that sometimes your dog is not going to let you train those tasks you can start the foundations but your dog is not going to be ready for those to add too many tasks on depending on the environment that they're growing up in and um, their mental status in general and it doesn't mean that your dog's going to fail if you don't have a really solid task by the age of two it just means that your dog is maturing more slowly they don't need a little bit more time Owner trainers don't have all the experience and resources that some programs do like guide dogs for the blind where you know, they're popping out 500 perfectly trained dogs every year. We're doing, you know, if, if you're training your own dog, you're doing one dog every three years, you know, there's a difference. Or longer. Or longer. And there's a difference and don't rush it. It's much better to go slow and make sure your dog knows it and give them the time to mature at their speed and not be on some race to get finished because they're always going to need training because we start training them to do all this stuff they're smart and they're smarter than the average bear or dog and we need to be prepared for that because they're going to be more challenging than most pets if we work really hard to train them up until they're two and then all of a sudden they're fully trained and we just stop training they're going to get bored and all of a sudden we're going to see behaviors that we've never seen before because we stopped training. So no matter how old a dog is, they always need training of some sorts 
whether it's refreshers on tasks or refreshers on obedience or teaching them something brand new. I mean, scent games are one of my favorites because you can always expand scent games and make them harder in a fun way. So you can do it whether it's going to lead to another task or just for a fun game throughout the dog's whole life. So let's end on that note because we have had a lot of information and I know we probably overloaded some people. And so if you do want to learn more about task training your dog, be sure to check out our Plus R Service Dog Task Group. I will put 